We are live, everyone. So my name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And of course, there are no classrooms right now. All of you are tuning in on YouTube, and so we so appreciate you joining us as we continue to highlight amazing scientists, explorers, and facilities around the globe. Today's exciting for a number of reasons. Number one, it is our SciComm Storytime series. So every day at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, we have been highlighting some of the rock stars of science communication, all brought together by the amazing Emily Calandrelli. So thank you to her for continuing to bring us this awesome lineup every single day of people. And two, it's a really spacey day today. By the end of the day, we will have had four, three, three NASA research scientists and our speaker today. So we are joined live by Athena Brensberger. So she is Astro Athens. It's social media, it's a website, it's all sorts of amazing tools to highlight the magic and wonder of space. So she does astrophysics demos, rocket launch behind the scenes, takes you to some of the coolest facilities across the globe, doing stuff to put people and robots into space. I'm really excited about it as a topic. I hope you guys are too. And so without further ado, thank you so, so much for joining us today, Athena, and take us away. Hi, everyone. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. Thanks so much, Jesse. Uh, so I have so much to talk with you guys about from, of course, what he was saying when it comes to astrophysics demos, to going to rocket launches. There is so much that's happening in space that I'm sure a lot of you guys are aware about. But something I wanted to talk with you guys about is something that really I hold dear to my heart and it's known as a propylid. I just try to say that name with me, propylid. It is so adorable. And <laughs> it's actually an acronym um, because you know in space, we always love using acronyms for things. And a propylid, is a protoplanetary disk, or as I like to say, a baby solar system. Now, this is actually what started my research when I was an undergrad student studying at the College of Staten Island out in New York City. And um, I got an opportunity to conduct research um, under the NASA Space Grant at the Hayden Planetarium. So if you guys have been to the Hayden Planetarium, give me a shout out, leave a comment. I love the American Museum of Natural History. And um, yeah, the Hayden Planetarium is awesome. And while I was there, I got to do research on these things. I want to show you my laptop real quick. These, if you're able to see the image, these are propylids. And you know, when you guys look up at the night sky, you can look at the Orion constellation. It's a winter constellation. You're able to see the three dots that line up its belt. And you should still be able to see it in the evening now. Um, and just below the three dot, the three stars in the belt, is a big glob that's known as the Orion Nebula. Now the Orion Nebula, I will actually do a demo for you guys. Um, I'm gonna show you on my wipe off board, so I'll switch the camera around in a second, but pretty much it's a big gas cloud where baby stars are forming. It's known as a stellar nursery, which is like super cute. I just love that name. Like this is what astronomers are calling things. They're like, hmm, baby stars are forming, stellar nursery. And this is how propylids can form. So I'm gonna turn the camera around for you guys. And I'm gonna show you a quick whiteboard demo. Alrighty, so here's my wipe off board. And you can tell I've been using it quite a lot actually. So you have this giant gaseous cloud out in space known as a nebula. This is the Orion Nebula. Now this likely forms from the death of a star which is a pretty cool recycling process out in space. And what happens is in certain regions of this gaseous cloud, there'll be places that are a little bit more dense, kind of like lopsided. This is where the gas can collapse and a star could form. And then there's these baby stars forming all over the cloud itself. Now, for those of you guys who might have known a little bit about star formation, these stars, when they form, they're super energetic, just like a bunch of kids that right when they're like hitting five years old, and they start rapidly rotating. Now, when they're rapidly rotating, what happens is because it's spinning super, super fast, it's actually attracting all of this gaseous material and the cloud. So this cloud, which is made of all this other stuff, it's actually bringing it in now. And then what happens next is it starts to form kind of like a donut shape around that star. So let me clean this up just a little bit right around here to show you guys, because we're gonna now zoom in on this star formation. So it's starting to create this like donut shape right around the star. Now, if we were to zoom in even more, what can start to happen is planets can start to form because this is known as an accretion disk. 
And this is like literally how the solar system, our very own solar system, planet Earth, Mercury, Mars, Jupiter, all the other planets formed this way because in certain parts here, it can actually start to form. Now, what a proplet is, is, let me erase that really quick. Sometimes within this gas cloud, there can be really, really big stars, like teenager stars. So it's like you're on a playground. There's like a teen star, and then there's a baby star forming. Now, when this baby star starts to form that donut shape, remember what I called it, the accretion disk? What can start to happen is this big star can have something known as stellar wind and bow shock radiation, bow shock radiation, bow shock radiation. That could actually cause all of this to get blown away. All that hard work that the star was making, trying to form a solar system can get blown away by this massive star. Now, this is why, and I'm gonna show you my computer in a second. This is why proplets have a teardrop shape. They have a teardrop shape because their stuff is literally getting blown out to smithereens out into space because of that massive star. So what my research was, because my passion was to try and find life beyond Earth. And for me, if you can find a solar system forming, you might be able to find eventually life beyond Earth. So for me, my research was to measure the distance between that baby star and that teenage star. So that's the D, D for distance, and be able to see if it's far enough where it won't completely get blown to smithereens, but close enough where it actually can still have some of that warmth from that nearby star and some of like the other gas and dust that can accumulate to eventually form stuff. So to me, it was all about trying to find that because if we can find how many can actually survive to form a new system, then maybe we can figure out how many of these systems exist in the Orion Nebula. Now I'm gonna turn that camera back around. <laughs> Hello again. So that's like the little like demo of kind of how I explain to, to people. It's actually what I did in front of a ton of uh, PhDs and researchers um, at the Hayden Planetarium when I gave uh, one of my first uh, poster talks. I literally got up there and I drew, it was a little bit more fancy. This is a wipe off board from the dollar store, but who needs something fancy? But I drew up for everyone what exactly happens. And so if we were to refer back to these images, what's really cool is I'm going to show you one. And I, I can, I um, really um, advise you guys later to, to go onto Google Hubble Space Telescope and just type in proplid. You actually don't even have to type in Hubble Space Telescope. It'll come up automatically. Type in a proplid and you'll see these awesome images. Look at the shapes of those. So you can actually see that bow shock radiation I was talking about. That's what the curve is right here. That's the bow shock radiation coming from a nearby massive star. And then you can actually see the accretion disk for me. You see that donut shape in that one? Now, like I said, later you guys can definitely look at these images, but it's so cool because right there is where the planets can start to form. And then this research will then lead into the SETI project, which is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And it started by Dr. Frank Drake, uh, also known as for the Drake equation. I wish I had my t-shirt on for this. Um, and it's so fascinating because if we can figure out how many of these proplids can survive to eventually have planets form, then we can start to calculate how many of the, those planets can be within the habitable zone. Some people call it the Goldilocks zone. And that's because if you guys remember the nursery rhyme, it's not too hot, not too cold. Well, yep, in the planetary system, it's not too close to the star, not too far from the star, where um, possible life can form, where there can be an atmosphere, where, where stuff like here on earth can actually happen. So that can definitely aid into the equation as well. But for me, it was all about trying to find that. So that's a little bit of my background um, as far as what my research was. But um, the other thing I wanted to talk with you guys about was how I followed a few different paths in life. Um, while I was actually doing this research, I was living in New York City. It's where I'm from. I'm from Brooklyn. What up? Anyone from Brooklyn, give me a shout out. <laughs> Say hello. And um, I got scouted for America's Next Top Model. Now, I know that's super random, not even science-y related. 
but I, it's, I think it's important to talk about because I've met so many people, so many human beings and so many kids just like yourselves who want to pursue arts, but also want to pursue science, want to pursue musical theater and be a microbiologist. And you can do both. You can follow every dream that you want because we're living, especially now in the internet era, where you actually can really test out every single pathway for yourself to seek a mentor, to experience an internship, especially what NASA is offering. You can do different things at schools where you can learn to be like a creative director or, or um, yeah, like a, a director for a theater project. There's so many different things that you can do. And you'll start to find this beauty when you pursue both industries where a lot of them actually overlap. And I've met so many people um, just in my career for modeling, which has been about 10 years now, where they're makeup artists, photographers, other models, actors, and they happen to actually have pursued a degree in biology or they happen to pursue a degree in chemistry. And there's such a beauty when you, when you notice that because you know, the human race, we're so much more intertwined with these boxes than we think we are. And um, I just, my, my main message is just, you really can pursue all and both at the same time. And um, I think it's so much more important when you realize that because we, each industry needs each other. And we really do. I mean, if you guys have even looked around at Target, Walmart, Forever 21, they have NASA collections. I got this from Walmart. This is just a little NASA mug. And, and this is for like from Target. This says, take me home. And it's an image of the Apollo mission. And I think that that's so beautiful because we are now merging fashion and space. And that way we can actually get to the bigger public. We can get to more people and inspire the new astronauts, the new era of kids that want to become, you know, space travelers, space voyagers, the first Martians. So yeah, I just wanted to share that with you all. And <laughs> that's, uh, that's a bit of my journey, but I want to see if maybe we had any questions from anyone. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you so, so much for that hyper enthusiastic presentation. I think you actually packed more words into 12 minutes than we've ever had in the history of exploring by the seat of your pants. So thank you for that, Athena. Oh, yay, of course. <laughs> <laughs> for everyone tuning in on YouTube, yeah, just let me know where you're joining from. Type in questions. We'll take as many as we can over the next 18 minutes or so. In fact, you have one right off the bat from Cassidy. From uh, her question is, are clouds in space the same as clouds on Earth? Okay, so no, they are different. Um, although they contain similar elements, so um, hydrogen, helium, some of the most um, common elements in the universe, the clouds on Earth are what actually usually has water molecules in it. Most of these, although they may eventually contain water molecules later on, these are actually the remnants of a star that died. So when a star dies, it actually will release everything that it lived in its life out into being a gas cloud. So whether that's through a supernova, which can later collapse into a supermassive black hole, or through um, a red giant star, which will start to kind of expand and then just puff out its outer layers. And that'll turn into usually a diffuse nebula or an absorption nebula. There's different types of nebulae. Um, usually those are more of like the basic elements. So hydrogen, helium, you'll find some nitrogen. Um, and usually you can tell because of the different colors, um, especially in the nebula. So if you guys were to check out like the Hubble Space Telescope images, you can see the different colors and they'll actually break it down for you. Where Neon, I believe, um, is, yeah, so there's like, yeah, there's different elements. They'll actually tell you all the, all the details for each one, but there's like pink and there's red and there's orange, and they'll actually do color filters to extract those elements, elements and make them more present. Um, but usually it's a bit different than the clouds on Earth um, because also these won't cause rain. These won't create an atmosphere out in space, um, but they will eventually lead to a star that can form and then planets that can create the clouds like on Earth. Super cool. Um, you said something near the end of your presentation, and so all along with SciComm Storytime, we featured hip hop artists, we featured makeup, uh, you know, science tutorialists. So you talked about modeling for a decade now. How has that experience helped you in your science communication life? A lot. Um, actually, when I chose to pursue the career for, for modeling, it was because I wanted to actually go into acting. 
first and nothing was really picking up for me with acting. It was like super cutthroat industry, which it still is not that modeling isn't, but um, I thought, okay, if I can pursue modeling, it can open the door for acting and I can learn to actually be a better communicator. I can learn to um, adapt those people skills and what it's like to actually be on camera versus being on stage. And so I actually purposely done that to sort of aid into my science career before I even thought about pursuing a, being a science communicator. It kind of just, I realized one day that that is an actual career and I could pursue that. So yeah, the modeling has helped quite a lot. Um, it also has helped because it's given me such a different perspective of like advertising and marketing. And if we're able to do that for science, especially for space, which wasn't really done for a long time, because I mean, honestly, scientists, a lot of them are, they're busy doing their research. They're busy conducting really important things, you know? And so because of that, um, most of the time, they're not going to spend 75% trying to market what they're doing. And so it's important for people like myself or for like what you guys are doing to, to advocate and show the world what they're um what amazing discoveries they're making and what type of research they're doing so with modeling i've been able to actually learn quite a lot of that and um yeah just what like the general public really is attracted to and what they're interested in when it comes to fashion and and now with, with like diversity and i love that finally it's so amazing you know it's so good so yeah Fantastic. <laughs> um, it's hard to keep up, and that's rare for me. Uh, Sorry, great. I know I have a lot. No, of this is fantastic. No, <laughs> on the contrary, this is a lot of fun. I'm having a great time. Um, so Emily Calandrelli joins in on all our sessions. She wants to know what is your favorite launch you've ever seen. <gasps> oh, my favorite launch. Okay. Um, hmm. Let me see. Well, my first one was for the Gozar Weather Satellite, which is what tells our weather on our apps. Um, Insight was amazing, but I didn't see it because in Vandenberg, California, where it launched from, there's lots of clouds. Um, okay, my favorite launch, and it's funny, it was an, it was actually, I caught it by accident. I didn't know it was happening, which is funny. I'm usually on top of that, but SpaceX has been launching a lot. There was a point last year when I was still living in, in LA where they were launching like every single week. And um, I happened to be on Venice Beach in California, catching the sunset. And it was on a Saturday evening. And why that's important is on Venice Beach, they do these drum circles where a bunch of people get together and just start playing like maracas and drums. And so I kind of just join them to like dance and sing and stuff. And the sunset's happening. And then right after um, the sunset happens, you start to have twilight. So you have the stars rising. And then you have a laser like bicycle show that starts to happen. People will just kind of wear these things and they, they drive around. All of a sudden, I start hearing all these people yelling and screaming, and they're like, what's that? Ah! And I look up, and there's this, like, massive, like, gaseous cloud thing. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I've seen that before. That's a SpaceX launch. That's stage separation. I had no idea there was a launch happening right now. I'm like, this is awesome. And so I looked up, and it's just all these colors. And then you see, like, that it was just, I can't even explain it. Like, I'd have to show you guys the pictures one day. But... I'm sure if you Google it, you'll see it. But I heard people on Venice Beach being like, oh my gosh, is that a UFO? Is that aliens? And I'm like, no, that's like humans did that. It's a rocket launch. How amazing is it? So and that had to be my favorite because it was just combined with all that other stuff from the sunset to the drum circle to the stars rising and the laser bike show. Like it was just, it was just so beautiful and you could hear it and and you just saw the whole i mean it lasted for like 30 minutes you could see the whole process and then you saw re-entry of the booster going to land and it was oh it was my favorite <laughs> we need to take that entire answer and just send it to like the venice beach tourism authority and just <laughs> put that up because that was glorious thank you for that they would have totally a lot unexpected of way of answering that question um all right we have someone joining all the way in mumbai uh and they want to know do you think there's the possibility of a planet with perpendicular rings? So rings going one way, rings going up the other way. Ooh, that's a great question. Uh, first off, hey, Mumbai, that's awesome. I've been uh, dying to actually go to India, so really cool. Um, as far as perpendicular rings, I mean, typically, from what my understanding is when it comes to um, like ring formations around planets, there is... Um, you know, the gravitational pull, like of Saturn, for instance, that will attract in any type of like icy particles um, or like the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. So 
typically it'll all accumulate in one region in order for it to also go the other way there would have to be like some type of counteracting like some type of counteracting gravitational pull from my understanding from what research shows right now it would not I, I, at least from what i am aware of it wouldn't be possible it would be a great cool thing to see but um, as far as right now, it, even if it did start to form for a short period of time, eventually it would start to just all coagulate and then just continue within one symmetrical pattern. Because to have both of those, you would have a lot of collisions happening between the rings going this way and the rings going that way. And a lot of times there'd probably be like, a, like, a, like an overlap here or here on the other opposite sides of the planet, where eventually it can just start to turn into like, a disaster probably and then that planet would probably have a lot of craters and a lot of asteroid impacts i can't imagine it would probably be really bad actually <laughs> but now that I think about it, i've never i never thought about that before but that's a really awesome question i like how we went from like answering the question to like sci-fi dystopia here's what would happen to the planet um <laughs> oh, no no <laughs> so oh dear this is so much fun um Maynard, our hip hop MD from yesterday, he wants to know what space discovery or upcoming launch are you most excited about? No pressure oh, at so, all. Wait, what'd you say? <laughs> I said no pressure at all because I think you're oh, on the call equally. <laughs> I know. I mean, I, I automatically know what launch I'm excited for, which is Demo 2 mission, which is the Crew Dragon through uh, SpaceX. So that's gonna, what's going to have humans on it, launching from American soil again. And the reason I'm so excited is, first of all, the launch itself is going to be spectacular. I can only imagine what, how many people are going to be at that launch. And um, I never got to go to the space shuttles when I was younger. I wasn't around during Apollo. So I would probably be in tears just to see the amount of people and energy that's going to be created at one of these launches to be cheering on like fellow humans launching from American soil. And although I'm all for like us launching, you know, with, with Russia launching from Kazakhstan and everything and using the Soyuz capsule. I, I'm so, um, such an advocate for, of course, interna international collaborations, yeah. but I still think it's so important to see um, each country launching their, launching people from their soil. And the US hasn't done it in a while. So that's gonna be such an amazing launch. So I'm definitely stoked for that one. That one's what, like, probably my favorite, I think coming up. So yeah, there's Mars 2020 Perseverance rover, which I'm really excited for, but I'm really excited for demo too. <laughs> Do we have a timeline on this? Because this is a rocket launch that I want to come down to personally from Toronto, and it is going to be such a spectacular thing. Is it the plan for any time soon or later this year? Yeah. So um, SpaceX said that it won't be any earlier than May. Um, I believe the the goal right now is like the very end of May, like May 22nd. Um, and of course, with coronavirus, it may be getting pushed a little bit. I mean, they've still been launching, like SpaceX has been launching Starlink and everything like that. So um, it's possible, but since that has people involved, it might get a bit pushed. But I know the goal right now is like end of May. Um, so I, I actually have an app called like Space Flight Now, which is the best app in the world. And I'm like always tracking, <laughs> total shout out to, to them, but I'm always tracking the launches um, on there. And I believe it said like May, May 22nd or something. So. Something yeah. Something. Um, quick follow up on that. You've mentioned SpaceX a few times. So one of the questions is, is which space company is some, the one that you're most enthused about right now? Is it SpaceX? Is it another one? What's going on? Um, hmm. I mean, I'm definitely really excited for, um, you know, what NASA is doing with Artemis. <clears throat> That's super important. So, um, and especially since NASA and SpaceX are partnered for Demo 2, you know, they're, they're, that's like a combined collaboration. It's always hard for me to choose just one thing, um, especially with like, yeah, I'm like also working with Ariane Group. So, um, you know, Ariane Group is part of Ariane Space and they're launching rockets. So I know they have Ariane 6 launching this year, which is their newest rocket, their newest configuration. So I'm really excited for that launch as well, because this is going to be a beautiful rocket as like four boosters on it. So that's going to be in November. So I'm really excited for what they're doing. And, um, and they launched from like the jungle the Amazon down in French Guiana. So I think it's like pretty awesome. So um, yeah, I would say, um, yeah, it, it's hard to just choose one to be honest, but those three I think are, are super important for me. Fantastic. I'm gonna go back to something you talked about earlier in your presentation. So you mentioned these stars scattering all the things that they're made of around the galaxy. So I've heard from the Hayden Planetarium and some of our viewers might've heard too, that we're made of star stuff or made of stardust. Mm -hmm. 
Can you explain a little bit about that for those who are romantically inclined because it's such a great story? Yes, so every element that a star is composed of, we also are composed of. So um, although we have heavier elements as well to, to create such complex bodies and physical matter, um, we also contain the same basic elements that stars have. And in the star's core, which I think is probably one of the most beautiful things about stars, is they have something called nuclear fusion that's happening. So you'll have like a, a, literally a collision and then a fusion, a sinking of different atoms. So you'll have like hydrogen and hydrogen atom fusing to create deuterium. And then that will fuse with a hydrogen to create helium. And then that will fuse and so on and so forth. And it creates all of these different elements just in its core. And um, that's what powers the star. That's what produces its energy. And we too share those same elements. And so I think when we start to kind of internalize and look at what it is that we're composed of and how stars gain their energy, I almost feel like we can channel our inner star energy as well. That's like super silly to say, but it just came to me right now. But um, yeah, but we're made of the same exact elements as them and more. And so it's cool when you look at the stars at night, it's like, hey, how you doing brother or sister? You know, it's, it's pretty cool. They're our family. Fantastic. And I think channel inner star energy would also fit with the Venice Beach Tourism Board. So if you want to take that to the yes! next, you're all set. <laughs> <Let's do this. laughs> um, all right. Some more questions coming in. Uh, Cassidy wants to know, did you go to college or have you been involved with NASA in any way? So yeah, though, when I was involved with NASA, it was first in college. So um, I actually had just taken an astronomy 101 class in college. And this is actually because um, went into school to pursue astrophysics, was really not good at math to be honest I have a really bad background in math um finally got through that but and I mean bad as in like I was in remedial algebra in college which um is not a great thing to admit but it's 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 I think important so that everyone can understand that you know we're, we're all at different levels and it's not going to just come innately immediately if you love it you'll still pursue it so um when I had taken astronomy 101 it was because I was like I'm going to go into political science but I still want to do an astronomy class because I want to pursue it my professor was like, okay, I read your paper when you went to the Hayden Planetarium for a school project. He's like, you better be in a astrophysics major. He's like, you love this stuff more than anyone in the class. He's like, please like, you know, pursue it, make it your, make it your major. So I ended up changing it back. Um, and he offered me an internship that summer at the Hayden Planetarium. So Dr. Charles Liu, who's amazing. He's actually been on Star Talk a lot with Neil, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. And he um, is the one who had a, a space grant under NASA. So the NASA space grants is actually uh, given to a lot of like undergraduate students to conduct research for NASA. So that's how I first started with NASA, then pursued the career of like space stuff, uh, sorry, uh, modeling and acting stuff. And when I got affiliated with NASA again was through a program known as NASA Socials, which if you guys haven't heard of it, you totally should apply. It started as NASA tweet ups because it was meant for Twitter and it was for everyone, all walks of life, not just space enthusiasts, but like everybody, artists, creatives, um, everybody, lawyers, uh, everyone. And um, they would allow for social media users to come together, get a tour of like the vehicle assembly building, which I just did for the SpaceX CRS-20 mission, which was the last mission for the Cargo Dragon. This was like three or four weeks ago now. Well, it was March 6th was the launch. So um, that I was through a NASA socials program and I've done three of them. And I'm hoping now actually when I start going to launches that I'll just be able to apply and qualify as press, which would be really cool. So that's another awesome way to, to yeah, be partnered with NASA. But um, yeah, it was honestly because of their amazing programs. So I would check out if I were you guys, um, their NASA socials programs, and then look at their internships as well. If you're currently pursuing a STEM major, um, I'll throw in the A in their STEAM because I actually had a STEAM grant as well. This A is for arts, so yeah. Amazing, so I'm gonna pass it along in the YouTube chat bar too, so anyone who's watching can check it out. I also love that you highlighted that you had struggles with math. I think that a lot of people that tune in on these assume that everyone who's on these programs whizzed through school, had everything come easily to them. And I mean, for me personally, math got hard when the alphabet got involved with it, so it's good to hear that uh, other people have had troubles. Um, yep. <laughs> all right, we're, we're gonna travel vicariously back to India for Harsh's question. Um, have you guys seen, have you seen The Expanse as a space drama series? If not, that's okay, but I'm curious if you could explain what you think of it, if you have seen it, and any other uh, depiction of science on screen or TV that you really recommend. 
Yes. Well, I love the expanse. Um, I, I, I'm like, I was a fan of the show back when I was living in LA and then met one of the main writers, um, at Yuri's night and which if you guys don't know about Yuri's night, super cool. Um, huge space party where actually is happening in two days. Um, so on Saturday and, um, I met one of the writers and then I met the whole cast, which was really cool. And then I fell even more in love with the show and continue watching it. And meeting them was so important because it showed me that they all did so much research prior actually filming. So the characters really dove in deep with the um, like actual science. Is this really possible? Um, actually, Bobak, uh, he works at JPL, so Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California. He, um, I believe, still is one of their science advisors for the show. So it's so important because when it comes to science fiction, although it's cool to have things that like we can kind of daydream about as far as like uh, like universe sandbox if any of you guys know what universe sandbox is yeah you can kind of create these hypothetical um size mass of uh celestial bodies and just create a whole new universe and have things kind of just explode or do whatever you want pretty much but what i like is with the show it takes legitimate science and asking okay is this actually possible because what we want our learners to we want our, our watchers our viewers to learn and that's what I like a lot about the show. Um, not only is it like really innovative, it makes you look at um, just everything differently. You know, if we, when we are to become an in, uh, proto, not protoplanetary, interplanetary species and, um, or multiplanetary species, it, you know, what's, what's it gonna be like? When we have people living on Mars, when we have an, uh, another orbiting space station, but with civilians living on it, like, what type of things are we gonna run into? And what I love about the show is it kind of talks a bit about like space policy. So when it comes to politics and also um, setting up rules when it comes to space. And I think that that's really important to look at. So I think it got a lot of wheels turning for people. Um, other things to recommend, I started watching um, Lost in Space recently on Netflix, which was really cool. Um, that's also a series and um, other stuff. Something like kind of random, not so spacey related, but it's <clears throat> a show called Night on Earth. And um, Night on Earth is a Netflix documentary where they put hidden cameras in places we've never had cameras before. So we're able to see animals in certain habitats behave in ways we've never actually seen before because we never saw them at night. And that is kind of tied to space because some of the episodes actually talk about how... Um, like polar bears in the Arctic are able to follow like 40 days of dark and 40 days, you know, obviously of light and how they're able to sort of, um, you know, adapt to like following um, like the constellations, following the star patterns, following like the sunrise and sunsets. And I think that that's actually really fascinating. Um, so I would recommend watching A Night on Earth if you guys wanted to learn a bit about animals. <laughs> Very cool. You mentioned someone earlier, and, and you mentioned a show earlier. I want to highlight as well Star Talk with Neil deGrasse Tyson and the Cosmos series. So if you haven't seen these, these are on a variety of streaming services, and you can you know buy the box set, and they're fantastic. Athena, we are out of time. So before we wrap up, is there a, you know you highlighted a bunch of great resources? How can people go and find out more about you personally? Like if people want to keep learning, going, and see all these amazing demos and ideas, where can they go? <laughs> so if any of you guys have tick. TikTok. I just started a TikTok recently, maybe about a month or two ago, and I'm doing a thing called DIY astrophysics. Um, so it's just doing little demos. And I really did it because I know a lot of you guys, uh, if, if students are watching, are doing school virtually right now. So a lot of you have to do presentations for your classrooms. So I'm trying to come up with ideas for your science classes and how to get, you know, extra credit or project uh, credit to try and pass your class. So on TikTok, um, Astro Athens, um, all social media platforms, I kept my name consistent, Astro Athens. My website, astroathens.com. And the past year, I've been working on a new function um, that I am going to be releasing soon on my website. Um, it's something I'm not going to talk too much about right now, but it's it's going to be coming soon on my website. It's So in addition to the videos and content creation, it's a whole new feature that I'm hoping will kind of tie the world together a little more. What a tease. People have to come check it out. How exciting. <laughs> Uh, Athena, thank you so, so much for joining us today. We really, really appreciate your relentless enthusiasm. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much. Uh, and yeah, for everyone tuning in on YouTube, do continue to check us out. We've got our great space day still coming up in the next few hours. And uh, check out SciComm Storytime every day, 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, as we continue to highlight some of the coolest SciComm rock stars from around the world. Thank you so much again, Athena, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Jesse. Bye. Bye.